<clears throat> All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the seventh workshop, which is going to deal with international relations. Um, the scope of international relations is obviously world war, because world war essentially like led to a lot of institutions um, coming up, but then also the development of international law came up just after world war significantly and people started like not just like recognizing it but also uh were obliged towards it because before that people had laws international treaties were there but then there wasn't a, essentially like a proper um law abiding mechanism that existed and therefore like a lot of wars and conflicts still used to exist but also obviously we're going to study about united nations politics general great great power principle and the power balance that exists in the entire world then principle of sovereignty self-determination basis of international relations oil politics neo-colonialism and then economic sanctions versus military military action the reason why all of these things are important is because essentially you would understand the nuance of like why a particular relation occurs as opposed to why like two countries essentially interact with each other and how this interaction essentially leads to like several outcomes so this you could essentially use in like analyzing a couple of arguments which i can tell you later and like go back to the arguments later as well but starting from what exactly happened in world war one is we all know that it led to deaths and sufferings a lot of people died 1.7 crore people died um and I, I i i'm guessing that all of the times um the idea that like deaths are always underrepresented and underreported so i'm guessing 1.7 is like the underrepresented data about how many people actually died in world war one but then who exactly was involved was colonies from Britain, um, France, Spain, Japan, Russia, etc. But essentially, when World War I started, they did not know that World War II could essentially exist. So what they said was that, oh, it is a war to end wars, meaning they thought that after this war, and it's going to be the greatest war of the entire history, after this war, nothing else can ever like occur in the entire like international um history if you want to term it as but then it was just assumed because just 20 years after that we also had world war II, world war ii in 1939 but how did it start is essentially in the end of 19th century when western nations um all of these things like civilization inventions technology and everything started like um emerging so countries started investing in military countries started investing in arms and so on and so forth but then um a lot of other things also started coming to picture meaning the clubbing of different nations who had kind of similar um interests but also the idea that look if two countries have the same rivalry they're going to come together and form alliances so things like treaties and alliances which were forming at that point of time um which basically was that if in case i am under threat of war you are essentially going to back me up um in these scenarios so um we also know that countries had different interests back then or, or it is going to happen always and so like a like a continuous process, like countries always will have different interests. For example, France wanted to recapture its territory from Germany, which was lost years ago. Then Germany had expansionism, meaning they just wanted to have as much territory as possible, just because of the fact that westernization and civilization. So they always used to have this like superiority complex that, you know, our ideology, our civilization, and we are more civilized than others, and we, should, we would be able to rule the nation or the territory better than others. Then you had Great Britain, which obviously wanted to have modernizing, uh, modern modern naval forces because they always used to think that the access to seas and is everything and like it's going to be strategically very good simply because of trade simply because of the access with respect to the transaction between two nations and so on and so forth but then um during this time we also had things like wave of nationalism which means that um countries like bulgaria Al Albin, albania and then like Rom romania all, all of these were like start started gaining independence meaning they understood that like look um we wouldn't let other external sources um go ahead and uh, rule us we essentially want to be independent and stuff like that so these are the things which were essentially happening during world war one but because of the alliances that were created during that time it led to an unstable europe so which basically divided the europe into two powers one was allied powers and then another was central power can anyone give me a quick um i don't know i don't think it's a it's a, it's a very difficult question but then who do you think won the world war um one yeah, no. Allied. Okay. Yeah, so it was allied powers. So basically, it was um, a combination of Russia, France, Great Britain, USA, Japan, and then um, Central Power had Austro -Hungar Hungarian Empire, and then um, Germany, Ottoman, etc. But then, if you want to like 
if you want me to tell you the basic ideas as to why World War One occurred, it's like a couple of reasons, but I'm just going to like um, club in into like specific heads. One is military, mil militarism, meaning, um, as I said, arms race, there was like tanks, armies and everything. Britain, USA and Germany were heavily uh, investing in all of those. Um, secondly, Europe alliances formed. I think I wanted to told you that a large number of alliances, triple alliances, all of that, all of that were uh, being form. Then you had imperialism, meaning they always, they wanted to expand their territory, they wanted to expand their colonies. So for example, a large number of interest conflicts happened between Europe, simply because they thought that, oh, Af Africa is a very good like, continent to essentially explore, but also there were a large number of di diamond mines which were coming up in the African region. So they were like, oh, who essentially is going to be able to like, colonize these nations and stuff like that. Uh -huh. so there were different differences between these nations, but also um, this entire race that who would be able to colonize um, these nations simply because they would be able to exploit more resources, but they also realized that economic superpower or like economic capability is essentially going to help them a lot. Um, and again, wave of nationalism, and I think already, I already told you about that. But um, what essentially, and I think you have already told me uh, about it. So um, what essentially immediately led to the war was basically a misconception. Um, so what happened was that um, Duke and his wife was um, were traveling and then during that time they were attacked and assassinated. But the people who assassinated belonged to Serbia. So what they, th what they thought was that um, it's a co like a collective action from Serbia, which might not or might be true, uh, but we don't know about it. So what they did was that um, let's just start a war against Serbia. And then they went um, and then this um, entire um, Austro-Hungarian empire went to Germany and then Germany was like, gave like blank check that go ahead, uh, like do anything. Um, and if you are going to invade, um, the, in, if you're going to invade Serbia, we are essentially going to support you as much as you want. So they basically said that go do whatever, we are standing behind you and you should be able to do anything. But then before the war actually happened, they essentially um, gave them this idea that, okay, do you want to like sign a treaty? And this treaty essentially was a very humiliating agreement. Uh, don't go into the details of it, but then essentially the negotiation, like if they wanted to come to a uh, to a negotiating table, they would essentially want to have something which is basically like going to help both of the nations, but it wasn't necessarily that. So Serbia essentially refused and then it led to the war. But who do you want to blame with respect to war? Is couple of like couple of people and I wouldn't essentially want to say that oh there's only one nation um who should be supported for it but um do you I think you all essentially know who it is but then do you know the about the popular opinion as to who is blamed for world war one who which which particular nation I think you have already told me about it when you were talk, talking about it I think it's Germany yeah, it's Germany. So everybody um, like stood against Germany um, collectively and they said that, oh, Germany is the one um, who is responsible for the war. However, Germany just supported Austria. But the problem is that because Germany supported Austria, it essentially led to more mobilization of war because the power that they had in terms of military, in terms of arms, tanks, etc., was much higher than others. Um, so Austria obviously was the first aggressor, Russia, was the first full-fledged mobilizer. And then you have the Greek, like Britain because they supported France. But then um, again, I think the idea is again, so we had escalation of war, we had alliance system. Uh, war was inevitable because we thought that there was mutual suspicion. So even though there were treaties formed, they essentially did not get, like trust each other, but they always used to be uh, under the threat that, oh, they're probably going to attack me someday. Um, and again, we had things like um, German capitalists because they had uh, a lot of economic superiority and they wanted to go ahead and like, um, like establish that against France and Russia. But generally, I think nobody calculated that this um, this conflict between two nations could essentially lead to a larger or like much wider kind of conflict because they always miscalculated that it's going to mobilize it to an extent which is going to be termed as World War One. So what did we learn in general through World War One is essentially that situations and these are the things which we like always and like much often they're not um, witness things like power hungry nations essentially uh, want to have more ability to rule uh, more ability to rule in terms of different uh, places regions and also uh, in terms of different um, territories and secondly 
countries essentially have expansionism and the ideology of like having as much of territory that you have, you would have obviously more access to resources, uh, more access to humans, more access to, um, you know, strategically ge geopolitical relations and stuff like that. Um, also, we realize that alliances are not always good because it could lead to mutual suspicion. Uh, it could also lead to, you know, like, you know, like how generally uh, when you have two friends fighting and then when you have groupism and then two groups fighting essentially leads to exacerbated fights that's essentially what happened in world war one then you have western supremacy so whenever there's going to be an extreme amount of western supremacy it would obviously lead to more um, interference from western nations but also that would lead that could lead to more conflicts i think it's still relevant today um we also let re re like realize that you know things like economic race and militarization could lead to things like conflicts and stuff like that but World War One is basically World War Two. Essentially, is basic um, when essentially when you understand is that um, we also realize by the end of World War One that sure war, war, wars are going to be um, occurring no matter what and no matter what, how much we want to avoid them. But the idea is that. Um, who is supposed to be held responsible? So collectively, the treaty that you guys were talking about, um, they all like stood together and said that Germany is to be uh, held accountable for that. And in that discussion of negotiation, Germany was always kept out of the communication, out of this conversation, which not only excluded Germany, but also put a large number of um, large amount of uh, damages and imp like imposed a large amount of liability on Germany. Um, the problem is Germany essentially like surrendered because they didn't have a lot of resources. The resources were exhausting. They also realized that like even though it's like years of war, it essentially isn't going anywhere. And there were internal problems in Germany, shortage of food, so on and so forth. Basically, um, they weren't as powerful as they were in the initial times of the war, but also like they miscalculated the idea that, you know, like when you have full blown war in, 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 in the first go, it's probably going to like lead to a very um, larger amount of outcomes, which never happens. So Germany realized that we don't have war, like we don't have resources, but they obviously openly did not want to say that. But they said that, oh, listen, we are guilty about it. But then we aren't necessarily capable of paying you a lot of, of damages, obviously, because of the same reasons that I stated, right? But 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 what they said, but all of the countries decided that look, Germany is supposed to a like give back all the territories that they, that it initially. Um, acquired and then be like all of the nations which faced a lot of damages like it, it was largely like punitive damage like it's not just like oh how much harm that has been done just like pay back that but more than that and therefore so many restrictions essentially um were imposed on germany but after some time what happened was um hitler the nazi party hitler came into picture and hitler essentially hated the idea of this treaty and condoned it but what happened after that is that um there were two more like after 20 years of world war one um we had two more allies which were being formed so one was axis power which was germany italy japan and then you had allied power uk france usa and poland poland russia china greece i find it fascinating that germany was able to capture france and poland even after like existence of uk usa russia china and greece that's like one of the biggest thing that i think hitler has done in his um rule which is obviously not to be appreciated but then the idea is that that a lot of like european nations were essentially um captured by hitler so it was um denmark norway belgium netherlands so on and so forth a lot of them right but the problem was the biggest mistake uh in his hitler's life is that he went ahead and tried to capture russia it obviously you cannot capture russia now going on i think the idea like at the end is that um because of the Hitler's ideology and because of the Nazi ideology of like killing a lot of um, Jews, um, I, I can't even like stress, up, stress upon the idea of how many people died because of Hitler is that two crores, more than two crores, but also like in the World War II, more than military people, the civilians died because of World War. So understand like World War and the atrocities of World War is like much higher than you expect. And that's why it's like condoned as much as possible, right? So Hitler essentially realized then that because of like a large, large scale rebellions, large scale like um, attacks from like other nations and stuff like that, Hitler went ahead and Hitler, as you know, he was narcissist. He cannot face the defeat. He cannot see somebody else executing him. Uh, again, like uh, execution is something which have happened after the World War II came to an end um, because of the fact that a lot of military individuals who were responsible because of the state action were executed and were imposed the punishments and were imprisoned. Um, that is a different story. But then um, Hitler committed suicide with, after which 
Germany did not have anyone to rely on, which is, which is why Germany surrendered against all of these nations. So, you know, a lot of deaths, uh, but essentially there was something to speed down as well. So negatives, I think we all understand what are the negatives of World War, but before that, I want to have a quick discussion of what do you think are the impacts of World War? So you can also like repeat as to what I said, but your general understanding of what is the impact of war, it does not have to be only um, World War, it can be any war, any conflict. The commonest thing is that people die. Okay. Um, economic harm. Um, I think at this point it was realized that the League of Nations wasn't a good enough organization to maintain international peace. So they obviously thought that a new organization like the UN has to be formed to maintain security and peace internationally. Um, I also feel that during war, like when you see your country fighting a war and actively winning, yeah. there is a like sense of nationalism. So there is an increase in like the sense of like that your country is fighting a war for the good of the people, etc. Um, loss of resources. Okay. The argument of nationalism can also be flipped, saying that the country that loses also, uh, you know, faces a lot of repression, and that's why it leads to like a lot of resentment. Anything else? What do you think is happening right now? Do you think war only impacts um, military or do you think war only impacts the two nations which are involved in war? Let's just take the example of Russia and Ukraine. Probably trade them. Uh, trade yeah. All countries are affected because like the trade cuts off or like they don't get enough resources that they're getting from the countries at war. Why do you think all nations essentially are impacted? Because it's just two nations, right? Basically, like the economic resources and any resources, the country get depleted, right? So there's hardly any trade or exports, imports going in and out. So other, um, so other countries that depended on on them for imports, exports, um, they get blocked. Do you think the difference between um the previous wars and today's war is just like very large scale? Because like uh, the amount of uh, interconnectivity between the nations was lesser as opposed to today. So uh, because of this this globalization and because of the idea that like all the nations are essentially connected to each other um don't you think the impact is larger and is going to be larger today yeah definitely it's going to be much larger and uh ma'am also russia is the largest importer for oil to europe and ukraine is the largest importer of wheat to the world actually so that really makes a big difference to the whole world since all of their export i mean import is getting cut off hmm but more than that, I, I did read somewhere that the way international politics has been impact, impacted by globalization is that there's obviously a tendency of states to actually want their own benefit, to want their own protection. But the moment they see any threat by any particular state, even if it's not towards them, they immediately try to strengthen themselves. So probably just so that you're trying to restrict yourself from the global market. So probably India's response to the Russia and Ukrainian crisis, just to impose more travels, just to ensure that there's no export of wheat from this country to manage inflation in our own country, which means that you become much more restricted and you end up creating a much more hostile environment at large. So probably the situation posed the Gulf War um, back in 1960s, I guess. Yeah, 1960s. So leading to the entire situation of whether or not they want of whether oil supply chain was working and who was it working forward for that who was it centric for so was it the united states or was it uk or was it russia or was it neither of them it was just the middle eastern states fighting fair enough anything else also, like it was like other economic prices are raising because like Ukraine and Russia, Russia is like a large exporter of oil. So like it was still like uh like having a trade with India. Like but the prices of oil in like other like, uh what can you say that in the market were raising higher. Like they were raising. Hmm. So it was exporting oil, but the prices were like going like raising uh reaching the sky. Hmm. Cool. I think at this point we have exhausted what the like everybody has to say. But then just like let me just tell you the positives of World War. Um, not saying or not like not justifying World War per se, but in case if in, in in any debate you have to say that oh World War like essentially gave you some amount of leeway, some amount of uh, understanding. You can probably use these points. Um, firstly, 
social changes um, because of the fact that a lot of men had to go to war. It essentially lead to women entering those workspace because essentially like some someone has to replace those like that man manpower at that point that point of time. So women entered into workspace because of the fact that men weren't present. Meaning now women were considered at least some amount of cap like capable to go ahead and like handle the work that men used to do earlier. Uh, but these men never returned back because essentially they died. Um, so essentially some amount of like um, dependency of women for, for you know manufacturing processes and everything was established. Secondly, massive technology development. Um, we did not have things like radio communication, tanks, aerial combat, machine guns and everything back then, which was um, innovated and um, discovered not discovered, innovated, developed in everything uh, because they felt that there was an urgency to develop all of these things. Um, but we also realized, and it sets the precedence of what not to do. So you essentially know that when there are two like two countries into conflicts, you essentially don't suspect. The first thing that you do is not getting into the resolution with respect to um, going ahead and like killing each other or invading each other. There's something called as um, negotiation and stuff like that. So they understood the necessity of negotiation and not jumping directly to nukes per se. And then you have creation of peacekeeping organizations at like, like UNO, et cetera. And then you have um, also, um, can anyone tell me um, how Indian independence um, and decolonization happened because of World War? Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, I'll, I'll say a bit of it because I'm not sure of the whole thing, so you can continue. Yeah, I think uh, at that point, like uh, at some point of time, uh, this thing, India was inside of India, there was already a lot of movements going on and, you know, starting and ending like the Quit India movement and the non-cooperation movement. But the last blow or the immediate cause that led to India getting its independence was Japan uh, extending in the Far East. So as Japan closed into like Assam's boundaries, the Indians... Um, the Indians felt that it was necessary that they got their independence to defend themselves as a sovereign country and an independent country because Japan was obviously against British. So that meant that India would at, uh, automatically be in a vulnerable position. So at that point, I think uh, because of Japan's in like not invasion, but closing in on uh, India, they uh, were able to like get independence by, you know, British, the Britishers. Hmm, fair point. Anything else? Also that uh, since British was in the world war, uh, they took a lot of resources from India, especially a lot of manpower. I think there was also military conscription and that definitely did like prove to be a point of like resentment. Hmm. Um, further, yeah, I, I think further on that, um, why we do learn this in our history chapters as well, there was this certain sort of dominance that Britain had over the trade with Japan and India, specifically in regards to raw materials like cotton with Britain using it for their Manchester companies, etc. But the moment they uh, shifted their you know, focus to World War II, first of all, USA took up, but secondly, the fact that they lost their grasp on these markets at large, and thus the amount of leverage that they had over people started to vanish. So first, for example, if in the NCM, the main issue that people faced was the amount of economic loss that they were going through and the lack of survival uh, funds with them, that issue did not rise up again during the quit in the movement. Okay, point taken. Anything else? Um, Anna, you were saying something. If not, um, I have a... I don't know if someone is doing um, But, like, it was, like, saying, like, a, the... Uh, what do you say? Like, uh, the British, like, was... Uh, the focus was removed from India because, like, the British needed resources from, like, uh, going from, like, fighting and stuff. So they moved their focus and, uh, like, uh, their resources were going less in India. So, like... Like the focus totally removed, so that India got a better chance at freedom. Hmm. Yes. So that is all correct. I think that's exactly why um, Indians got independence, but also the idea that I think the same thing that I told you earlier, um, the friends of nationalism started increasing this ideology, also started like coming uh, like much more further because a lot of other nations were also getting independent. So like, why not India? But then secondly, I think importance of sovereignty was also increased um, because people started realizing that if we aren't going to protect our own territory, who would essentially do it? But also the fact that like, uh, because a lot of like 
territories were colonized enough, I think they realized that, you know, we don't want external uh, impact towards our um, uh, internal affairs and stuff like that. So importance of sovereignty was also something which is um, highlighted by the World War. But lastly, I think drawbacks of wars, like people started realizing that, you know, wars essentially create a lot of atrocities, harms, uh, and recovery from that is essentially very difficult. Um, but the fact that um, as of today, even though we have alliances, um, people wouldn't, and I hope they wouldn't resort to World War III because of the fact that, um, like, even if you see the recent examples, like, you see things like, you know, USA ditching other nations as opposed to, like, sending, like, troops and stuff like that. This is essentially because they know that, like, the moment they're going to go ahead and, like, have full-fledged full, full -fledged support from, like, more than one nation, essentially is going to, like, grow, like break out into a larger conflict. So they have also realized that, you know, like, um, if two countries are, like, fighting, um, let them deal their own problem. Um, all right, I have a quick discussion again. So do you all agree to the Indian neutral stance in international politics? And how many of you all know about non-alignment movement? Giving you like the latest example, um, and it's not, so the non-alignment movement, the sense, okay, Snape, go on. Yeah, so the non-alignment movement is basically India saying that they're not going to side with any superpower done immediately at the start of the Cold War just to ensure that we're, um, you know, focusing on our development and rather than getting involved in these fights of big countries, we being the smaller country are just looking forward to ourselves. Yeah, so the basic idea is that there is there is different needs of the developed nations and developing nations. And it's better that developing nations actually are like siding and like are not intervening in what is whatever is the affair of the developed nation because a we are capabilities are our capa capabilities are different our needs are different and our, our like you know the urging urging um needs are also different so why should we just care about it but moving on i think the and like just like giving you an analogy as to what i mean by indians india's neutral stance is not actively helping any country when it comes to war or not actively going ahead and supporting a particular country. Like you can just take an example of um, Ukraine, Russia war and like India North essentially taking a big stance. Um, yes, Arna and then Vidal. Um, so like the Indian foreign policy will prefer India's benefits first. So they'll, they'll keep them in there like a, how they will be like first. So how they will be benefited. So they prefer to keep a neutral stance. So Indian people are come first and are benefited. Like don't go with other side. So you're obliged to your own people as opposed to others. Yep. Um, yes, Lida. Also, I feel that India has a really huge economy in today's world, and therefore, like it's siding. Okay, I cannot hear you. So, uh, 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 I cannot hear you anything. I cannot hear anything. Vedant. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, so I feel that since India has one of the biggest economies, like mm -hmm. in the world especially, um, essentially it has this really huge like hold, like it is one of the biggest countries today. Mm -hmm. So I feel that a neutral stance is good because second of all, they are surrounded by countries like China, Pakistan, if India goes ahead and sides with the West in a conflict that uh, countries like Russia, China are involved in, um, it could possibly lead to first of cutting off ties with Russia, which is helping India oil wise, and second of all, possible threat in a uh, possible threat of an invasion from China. Hmm. Fair enough. I think considering that India is like still a developing nation and it's there is like there's a chance it's a super, it becomes a superpower later. Um, they need to ensure that they're not um they need to ensure that they're causing that, that they're making strong allies, but not at the same time not forming like main major enemies. Because as soon as they do that, um see like in US and 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 USA basically, um USA and China, if you if you side with for example USA as allies. China's allies uh, suddenly turn on you and they're like a big, big force, right? 
Uh, so you can't. So then there's like a lot of um, harm if you start like going against China. But then the same same ways that there's a lot of harm if you start siding with China and going with USA, right? So in, so right now as India being a developing nation, you need to um, they need to gather forces, right? Later they can pick a stance, but right now they need to get um, enough um, resources from both sort of like allies or both powers of the world. Hmm. Um, Nishka? Uh, yeah, so I think in favor of, in, uh, you know, in neutral stance, I would say that this has been touched upon briefly, but like the geopolitics of it. So like, for example, if you like go ahead and just like outright support the West, then we are like surrounded by neighbors who might just invade us. But I think something that might be said uh, for against as well in this is because, well, if you're just taking a neutral stance, then you're not exactly like condoning any behavior. So for example, you're not exactly condoning Russia's behavior like towards the Ukrainian citizens. Um, so it's not really like bringing any amount of like change, especially when there's like a humanitarian crisis. Hmm. Okay. Um, Anvi? Yeah, it's a small point, but I feel like the uh, whole point about um, in the strong allies and not strong enemies in the favor point can be turned around to say if you take a non-aligned stance or a neutral stance, ne- neither do you, no, no, actually you don't have strong um, allies, but you potentially have strong enemies because you have a neutral stance. But then again, that needs to be fleshed out pretty well to act, for it to actually work. Yeah, so like essentially the countries who are helping you economically before or like militarily or anyway, um, they're going to be um, a feeling the feeling of them not being supported essentially means that um you aren't like extending the trade into the kind of like support they actually want and essentially can lead to like loss of ally loss itself yeah it's like a very ambiguous state that you're in it's like uneasy peace and you know it's not dependable so yep um snake Right. Um, for against because I do think there's a lot of favor covered. Um, I have this analogy wherein I believe that the issue with neutrality is that when can you be neutral or what is the capacity of a person to be neutral? Because if you have that much amount of an impact that any policy of yours, any trade agreement is actually deciding the outcome of a war or aiding one country and let's say delegitimizing the very economic situation of one country, then you can't exactly say that you're neutral. For example, in the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, obviously at the face of it, SJ Shankar would go ahead and say that, hey, look, we're neutral. We do not want this war to continue. But the moment you allow oil from Russia coming into India, even irrespective of all the tariffs, of all the sanctions that have been imposed by the West, then it does show the fact that, hey, you're trying to aid Russia. But what does Russia want out of India right now is not weapons because they obviously have that much amount of weapons present. They just want some sort of an economic foothold to stand upon to make sure that their economy is not crippling down because of the war. That much you've already provided. So neutrality for a country like India is not uh, like possible at this current point because irrespective of what to do even in the Israel-Palestine issue if you just go ahead and you know vote neutral you are hating Israel you are making sure that Palestine is not a state and that in itself is enough till some extent right but I do think that if you're trying to be much more neutral in the future or if you're trying to let's say go up ahead with the idea of India being neutral, then there's this new idea coming from the government that we're not neutral, we're just multi-aligned with the neighbors, with you coming ahead and making agreements with Nepal, as well as Sri Lanka, as well as other countries. I then think that it's important to understand that India's interests are where India's interests are fulfilled through a cordial relationship with everyone. And that is not neutrality, but yet that ensures that India's foothold in the global power is present over there. But then again, one point for favor as well, that if this is the case, right, that if, you know, multi-alignment is not neutrality, but yet make sure that India's foothold is present everywhere, we think that then again, the idea of neutrality provides you a different kind of power also, right? So have you ever been in a room wherein there are two parties fighting each other and then there's this one neutral person? That neutral person can literally decide this entire debate. 
the amount of leverage that you automatically get by being neutral in the global scenario as well by you being listened to and you being the decider vote irrespective of whatever whether or not you are the decider vote you still get people after you this looks like people just um, the west just coming after india to convince you or russia coming to india to convince us this hmm. then provides you some space in the global power as well fair enough um vidhan do you have anything oh uh, no um, okay cool so what i feel in terms of against is because i think there are less points of against that um when who essentially chooses to be neutral is a very safe stance like because you are scared of like one country essentially um either backlashing you or like going against you and that's exactly the entire point of fever the point at which india feels that they have some amount of stance and stance is being taken by a country which is powerful and it essentially proves the narrative or essentially like provides the narrative that we don't want india has the capability to go ahead and take a stance but secondly it gives more clarity right the more clarity in terms of relations you have in terms of international relations the better relations you are going to form um in so far as like you are able to give the clear, like clear um uh, imposition as to who you are like who, who you want to support but also like the fact that you can't be friends with everyone so the fact that multinational friendship and everything and like you being able to have a space and everything doesn't necessarily like pan out as much because friends of everyone like a friend of everyone is not a friend of anyone is basically what i'm trying to say but you know like um again this idea of humanity in press can be like um built upon a lot more saying that um india at this point has to take stance um and you know it it is essentially going to make sure that you know um a there are some things which are like just um the fact that you know there are some principles that india yeah. essentially like focuses and like and also like um like promotes right things like peace and everything right so if that is the case if india is going to go ahead and like say that oh whatever russia is doing is it really goes against the very ideologies of india right so as a nation you should be able to like have a greater like front of telling us to what your ideologies are and going ahead and supporting that in the larger picture but going ahead and tell me this um this idea that like this house would commemorate the first world war tell me what are the most argument most obvious arguments from proposition basically you respecting that world first world war um was fought probably upon the fact that when you commemorate wars you do not commemorate the fact that it was a war you rather just say that hey look there were people that died and we should respect the fact that they participated in it and they were ready to die for their country so for example if you have a monument for cargill it doesn't mean that you said that hey look we so damn happy that cargill happened that's not what your point your point is that there were people that participated in it that died and they require that much amount of remembrance but also on second thought uh this can be easily countered by opposition saying that hey if you really want respect towards these peoples and towards these people take them as martyrs respect them you do not have to respect the idea of this war right mm-hmm. that is just i can go ahead and say that look first world war victims and have an entire war monument made that doesn't equate to me commemorating first world war so we'll first have to do a lot of characterization of what this actually means in the very first place hmm. cool anything else i've already given you a lot of positives of world war so think of it i think all of the arguments that you make for the proposition will be very interconnected so i will take the same characterization that snare did and then continue that we commemorating the world war because there were people willing to die for their country but then from that you can extend and also say that because of their sacrifice we are today able to know, we today realize why war shouldn't happen or the negatives of what had happened back then we we were able to like um not make the same mistakes again and learn from the history so from that you extend on to saying that we are commemorating uh, commemorating the first world war because um it's a realization of what not to do again and what should not hmm. be and i think i think i'll just like a 
you know developing over this very point over whether or not we should learn from history and stuff like that you can probably also add to the fact that the principles of first world war are being used in the current world the very same way characterized over why us is not getting actively involved in the russian ukrainian conflict but pushing in troops in ukraine that how the moment you make something like this happen you also in like de- develop it in the public at large as well because the issue right now is that people expect usa to go ahead and enter ukraine to protect ukraine but they don't realize the aftermath of it because they just think that it is a humanitarian response that is required the moment that amount of realization comes in from the society at last and even a chance of such an action happening in the future by any stupid leader that might be president as the president of the united states at last which is highly likely seeing the current surroundings hmm. sorry uh, right understandably it is not something that you want to even take a chance upon fair enough anything else yeah you can also yeah go ahead yeah so i feel that um when you commemorate a certain part of world war 1 because history is written by the winners you are essentially um you are essentially not concentrating on the losers and how many soldiers they lost and how they are martyrs because when you concentrate on the winner side right? for example in world war 2 when the uh, usa is won it start making it starts commemorating the first uh, it starts comm- commemorating its achievements in the second world war but in the process it is talking about how they beat japan extremely hard and how they destroyed japan but i that is kind of insensitive and additionally it is not like serving justice to the people who died in japan who fought the war so it's it's basically like um you give more attention to people who won and essentially even if you're yeah. going to go yeah yeah because history like, is written by the winners uh, like mm-hmm. historical yeah i think another um like argument for proposition could be that after the first world war we also had like the league of nations so it was like a first attempt at being a unified world with actual like new like negotiations taking place because they knew that war could like lead to a lot of uh destruction and death um but wouldn't this also that this can be easily countered by saying that world war 2 still existed um so it did not world war 2 right. act- but without the league of nations being formed we cannot exactly say whether like this entire concept of an entire global world that was completely unified would have come up in the first place right it would have like after the first uh, like, oh, sorry after the second world war we had like a better attempt at it with the united nations but this was the first attempt fair enough you can obviously like that is that by saying that how like league of nations actually did not have binding power so if it was the reason that post world war um gave rise to league of nations and people realized global war i think they wouldn't go ahead and like fight like like you know fight another war so you can obviously count it that but then yes and yeah i think i was going to say more about how uh, i think the whole point is basically saying that the un was formed right so something better a better attempt at the league of nations became the un but i think that also in the opposition can be counter- countered by saying that the un is not really effective and it has pretty similar yeah. ways to the league of nations but i think yeah overall it's a good point hmm um sne no i just noticed this underlying presumption inside proposition which i think we can develop much more upon and build up good cases for both sides is that when you're trying to educate people to not do something or to let's say not fight wars or to understand the harms of wars you do not need to glorify one or do you, you do not need to commemorate one that was fought in the very first place right because a why is this necessary for people to realize you can just say that people die and that's all that they need to understand Over why, over why it need not be done because mostly people are not humanitarian jerks that won't understand that why people should not die be even in like the sports of nationalism that people might have that we're going to just you know kill ourselves for our country we're going to fight this war to ensure the protection of our country i think that it is already present in the minds of the government that 
uh, there are better economic alternatives present. So till the moment that it goes into the minds of the government and till the moment it reaches to the minds of the people, I think it is good enough to understand that they won't opt for war because war is always and never the first option to approach, right? Yeah. And even when it is, it is basically provoked by an idea of intervention by one side. I mean, earlier it was the first thing to do. Like, use of force was That's the first thing. Yeah, but then now it is not. But the yeah, idea yeah. on that on that, what do you think is the binary on opposition? So if you're not come out, I cannot pronounce that. So if you're not doing this, what are you going to do? I think rather than pushing forward the idea that you know we're going to take this one war and push it as an example, we could just push forward the idea of you know glorification of the army. But while you're glorifying the army, you do it in a certain manner, right? You do not glorify the army as people that died. You know, like glorification of army can like bite you back by saying that you know everything that in terms of you know like uh, atrocities by army and how they you know like went ahead and like performed a lot of humanitarian crisis is going to be also like uh, legitimized. So I feel like the better way to go about it would be like condonation of force first world war. You can do literally like that. You can have the same benefits of proposition and opposition by like doing that. But isn't like condonation and condemnation of first no, world war? No, 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 condonation. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. Um, see, let out words in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I think we should just like move forward. Um, so we have realized there were a lot of positives which you can probably use. Um, going on to United Nations, I think we've already discussed about how League of Nations changed to the United Nations. League of Nations did not have a lot of like, um, you know, so the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson were necessarily followed, but United Nations why it was formed. Um, so the reason why I've written this, why the United Nations was formed is in, in any debate, if you have to characterize as to how United Nations looks like, or like what is the interest or like, what is as an actor United Nations should do. These are the things that you should probably highlight. Things like maintaining interna international peace and security, harmonious relations, um, basically cooperation between nations, improving living standards and human rights, essentially what United Nations should do. That's a different story as to what they do. So as an actor, what they should do is this. Going on as what UN has done. So I can give you a basic binary as to like, how UN has failed and how UN has succeeded. So things like what UN has done is like a lot of things, but let's just like highlighting a few of them. It's like basically it helped hundred nations, more than hundred nations basically um, to get uh, independence, but also uh, establishing the idea that like um, democracy is, is essentially very important, establishing the idea that free and fair election should happen. Um, you know, like as of now, more than hundred nations are getting like electoral assistance from United Nations. It has helped providing independence to many nations. Um, UN also had uh, has this thing called preventive diplomacy, where they have like actively said that um, have come up with like, these treaties of like non proliferation, non proliferation non-proliferation treaties and everything so like um the idea that like you shouldn't essentially use nukes and everything um disarmament treaties and stuff like that there are there is a lot of lot more things and a lot more incidences so if you want to have a good matter in your speech just like read this article it's really beautiful so you would know that okay these are the instances where un has done good stuff but you buy and buy and where un has failed is that UN could not prevent wars um israel and palestine palestine war wasn't essentially um like condoned by UN United Nations, so even they even if they tried to go ahead and pass the resolution into the, the Security Council, US used their way to power as usual. Um, again, uh, even though like a lot of people sacrificed their homes, a lot of people died. Nobody cared. Then Cambodian violence that existed, a lot of human rights violations happened, but then again it was ignored by United Nations. Okay. So Mali were attacked by UN officers. So UN officers went ahead to establish um good amount of you know like peace. Uh, missions and everything, but then they were attacked by the Somali uh, like government and all that. So a lot of peacekeeping missions, even though they go ahead and try to do it, um, essentially failed. Um, Navya, do you want to say something? Yeah, so for example, in a crisis, um, for example, like Russia, Ukraine, what mm -hmm. if the uh, US uses its veto power to say something and Russia again uses his uh, it's the, their veto power? No, no so that's not how it works. So it's basically like if I say that like um, we condone the idea that like Russia is invading in China, in in ukraine um veto is basically even if one person is against it out of the five nations it is going to be considered so there's no counter veto to that so one veto is basically against the entire right. so china france russia and united states united kingdoms and all of these have the 
permanent membership and they have the veto power. So let's say, and that's what happened, right? So in the Ukraine Russia thingy, um, Russia obviously vetoed because why would anyone say that? Ah, I want to hold myself accountable. So basically, like a lot of like internal politics is actually happening. So um, there's a lot of unfair use of veto power. So in the Iraq invasion, I obviously because it was led by US a US veto the 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 resolution and any kind of action that United. Um, Security Council wants to take. Um, again, Syrian war, uh, Russia war, like a uh, veto. So basically like the idea is that, if, that the existence of veto power in of itself is like a counter to, you know, having the democratic uh, understanding of what United Nations essentially stands for. Um, you can obviously go ahead and read this article as well. It's really amazing. It tells how 12 re reasons why United Nations has called, uh, failed. But the other problems in the United Nations is basically one permanent members, like five members that I've talked to you about. Um, basically, it like proves the idea that oh, five uh, five nations in the world are bigger than others, but world is bigger than five nations. That's problematic. So a lot of actions by these nations gets unchecked, meaning like all of these are actually nu nuclear like superpowers. So like things like there's a debate about like how a non-nuclear um, nation should also be a part of like a member country. Um, of the uh, permanent members, which obviously I don't know when it will happen, but it won't happen any soon. But then you have, it, it is also known as European club, you know, right? So for example, three out of five members of the five uh, permanent members is France, UK, US, obviously Euro, Euro, European club. But then you also have like communist club going on, like Russia and, uh, Russia and China being there. So it's also like a very counterproductive, like, uh, like discourse between both of them. And then you have UN works on the principle of democracy, but then when it comes to membership and when it comes to vetoing power, I don't think it's like actually democratic. Then you have failed to adhere to sovereignty. Basically, um, you know, like, and I'm, I'm going to like ex explain what um, sovereignty and self-determination actually is. So, you know, like how, um, when it came to Taiwan and like recognizing whether Taiwan is, should have this, the powers of self-determination, the United Nations essentially just like forgot about it, like ignored it, never recognized. So all of these things actually have happened. Um, and that's the practical reason why United Nations has failed. But there's something which you need to know about great power principle. Um, there's something which is essentially very interesting about it is one, I think a great power principle is like, in, is on the idea that look, there are some people in the world who are powerful and is recognized. So essentially you don't want to say that, oh, they're not, they're all, everybody is equal and everything. But then the fact that some people are always going to be um, powerful than other economically, uh, militarily, and everything. But you have to recognize the the more power that a country has, the more responsibility the country should also have, right? So there are always going to be like like powerful nations than others in the entire in the entire world. You cannot have economic equality and other. That's the great power principle. But the idea or the, the, the argument that you're supposed to use is the power balance principle. So the power balance principle essentially talks about that, you know, even though there are going to be different rates, can you give like name me, can you give names to me as to what are the great powers according to you in the in the world right now? US, China, Russia. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Um, Naveh, do you want to say something? I think right now it's mainly just like Russia, Ukraine. Uh, sorry, Russia would probably be one yeah. of the powers. Yeah. So the common idea is that there is not a single nation which is the superpower. There are different superpowers that are existing. And the interesting part is that these superpowers are against each other. US and China, if you want to take the example, or even Russia for that matter. The fact of the great power principle is that these nations will always try to make sure and prevent others from giving, gaining the most power. Meaning Russia, meaning USA right now, feels threatened that China is probably going to get more dominance over the entire nation, or over the entire world. And therefore they would make sure and try to prevent China from getting economic uh, superiority, uh, military superiority and so on and so forth, like just imposing random sanctions on them probably is going to help but then that's the that's the point so the the principle is that nations would never want a single country to have great power the greatest power in the entire world and therefore they would always make sure to prevent the others and that's why like a lot of like conflicts are existing between like us russia us china and everything and that's why you know because of the existence of the conflict it's always going to be maintained that there can be no single nation with the greatest power and that's the beauty of the international world Moving on, you have something called as principle of sovereignty, which is important because it's the foundation of international law. I'm not sure as to how many of you all have read about principle of sovereignty, uh, but tell me what you understand about principle of sovereignty in general. 
not like principles of morality, but like laws of morality. Do you, have you read about it? Political science. Okay, Snake. Right, just like a disclaimer, I do amiens. So, um, so the, in the UN Charter, Article 2, Clause 4, just states that you cannot invade into the territorial integrity of a particular nation, which simply means that you should not indulge yourself into some other person's domestic matters. So if India says that we're sovereign, it means that Russia is not going to be the person that is going to go ahead and decide the domestic policy, but also that Russia is not going to invade. Hmm, uh, I don't know. I mean, for me to even get that, like to know that article, I had to do a whole moot, which was ICC moot, to understand, oh, UN Charter exists, but then good enough. Like, I think you all know about articles and everything. Very impressive. Um, okay, Navya, do you want to say something or just like, um, just standing right there? Yeah, basically what Dr. What Snake said, I do MUNs too, but like, I don't, I, I, I just did for a year. You all know about it. I thought, oh my God, so I understood. Okay. So the idea behind uh, sovereignty is that um, sovereignty is basically this. Um, India as a nation should be able to have full control over the kind of international affairs that we have. For example, how the nation is going to function, how the economic relations are going to function with other nations. So it shouldn't be influenced by other nations. For example, China like dictating as to like, oh, you're supposed to trade with, with Bangladesh or you're supposed to trade with Sri Lanka and stuff like that. So economic, um, the, the sovereignty is basically the foundation of international law. Sovereignty is the reason why United States nation organization was formed sovereignty was the nation by uh was the reason why world war was actually also fought because they realized that you know what like we don't accept the idea of like expansionism or you know what uh we don't want in like external affairs um external entities uh, uh, interfering in our affairs so basically the idea is respecting territorial integrity of the nations and also every state must be able to decide the matters of their inter internal affairs um all states are equal before the international community we, which means that if there is going to be a case between um, in icj or in icc it shouldn't be the like case that oh this united nations is very powerful and therefore they can never do something wrong so even though that's a pra practical implication but then the principle is that the it shouldn't happen it, everybody is equal irrespective of the kind of like uh, economic capacity or like um military capacity that they come from now principle of sovereignty is like related with principle of self-determination now people are essentially against self-determination also because it can lead to you know separatist um, movements and everything but I'm, i'll come back to that later so basically all people all people have the right to determine who they want to be a part of and which territory they want to be a part of uh, and which nation essentially they want to be part of based on like and it can be like based on different reasons, different ways. Um, it can be one, people are not like satisfied with the government that they're uh, under. Um, but secondly, they have different ideologies. Thirdly, they have different ethnic um, origin, ethnic origins and stuff like that. Um, that's why India is very um, controversial with respect to that, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, so basically against the idea that, you know, we want to go against, we are against the foreign interfer inter interference because even if the government is ruling us, we think that it's a foreign entity because we cannot relate with the government and stuff like that, right? So you can have different um, arguments with respect to Taiwan, Ukraine, and Hong Kong, and the fact that they should be able to have a set determination. So even if like USSR is going to say that, oh, Ukraine is a part of Russia, but it's not the case because Ukraine has the capability to self-determine who they want to be a part of, and it should be given to them. Similarly, Hong Kong and Taiwan, they shouldn't be like essentially forced to, forced to be a part of China, which is bad because they don't want to be a part of China. And that's the that's the self-determination that I was talking to you about. Um, there are a lot of articles about like a Jammu and Kashmir, um, Northeast India, Tamil Nadu, and all of that. Which, if you want to like read, you can probably go ahead and read. Uh, because a lot of a lot of motions are there which talk about like you know separatist nations and how like India should give them the capability to do so. And obviously, as like as a nation, we are more emotionally attached to these to these states, and therefore we don't want to like um, have a conversation about it. But then, if you want to read about it, it's very interesting again. Um, so go and read about it as well. But mo moving on, what are the basics of the the basis of international relations and why? essentially two countries interact with each other the reason why it is important is that if in case there in, there's a debate about like the two nations which you don't know about it about the two nations in terms of like you know you cannot essentially read about every nation that exists in the world right and your motion can be about anything and they would just give you a paragraph of info state and then you'll be like oh my god what should i run so understand that even if you the, there are two nations which you don't know about there are certain ways how nations that interact and you can easily predict their 
um, behavior against each other. So first, first is like um, nations in that region are based, based on exchange of resources, like in natural resource, raw materials, skill bases, um, technology, and stuff like that. Secondly, exchange of solutions, meaning how global problems can be solved. Um, third, exchange of military, military alliances, Russia, France, US, Israel, UAE, and how they are alliances to India. Then you have alliances in terms of G7, G20, where you have environment, um, economy, and again, like, uh, and the fact that they are, like, you know, they are collectively together against the same problem of terrorism. And then you have economic alliances like free trade arrangements, uh, tariff free, quota free, and all of those things. Like you just like don't like cut all of all, cut off all of these things. And therefore you have more harmonious nation, uh, relations as opposed to others. Then you have ideological similarity, which is kind of like controversial because um, if you want to go by that knowledge, like by that um, logic, I think the fact is that, okay, if you want to support it, it's basically like, oh, US is always going to have uh, good terms with nations which are not communist, obviously, because they are like the 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 pillars of democracy, um, and therefore democratic nations obviously should have that good good relations with each other. However, the fact that communist nations themselves don't have good relations amongst each other, for example, China and Vietnam, they essentially fought a war. And also like the fact that, but but the other part of it is like, oh, Russia and China are having growing ally between each other, which is also a great, great thing. Again, like um, there's also one major basis of international relation, which is funny, is that um, there's common rivalry, meaning, uh, Common rivalry can be a reason of like two nations having good connections. So China and Russia essentially hate USA. So again, it's a common ground for bonding for both of them. Um, okay. Um, yes, Anvi, you can leave if you have a viva. I don't really mind. Uh, you can go back and like read the PDFs later. Cool. No, I don't um, think you asked. Well, can I find them on the WhatsApp group them itself? Yeah, yeah, it is going to be sent to there as well. Okay, okay. I'll go to the last. Cool. Um, may I know for how long more the session will extend? Um, it shouldn't last more. I think we are on um oil politics and then yeah, it should be just not that much. I think we we should be able to end it before eight thirty to watch the match. Leave by like eight fifteen, so I'll just finish. I'm wondering if that finishes by then. I mean, I'll try. Let's see. Okay. Then you have oil politics, which is essentially a very important thing. So I'm just going to give you a TLDR of what oil politics is, is that oil is extremely important as a resource because it essentially controls a lot of things. Um, oil controls war simply because um, the ability of the military ability is also impacted by oil because, you know, like um, crude oil can be used in a lot of equipments and stuff like that. So basically that's very important. The second is Second thing is that oil is also very important because it is um, uh, it is dependent. A lot of manufacturing industries are dependent on it. Um, automobile and industry and everything. So a lot of things, basically, just that. Um, so even if you say that, oh, a large number of cars are going to go electric cars, um, you cannot essentially say that because even electric cars use crude oil because they want lubricators and everything. So that is also a very, very important idea. So the reason why oil, oil politics exists is because there is growing understanding of like the dependence of like crude oil and spe specifically before uh, because the, there was invention of automobile industries and everything. But then now I think you can just debate upon that later. But then like the fact is that Western nations were very, very much interested in like oil and where are the mines and everything, how can we get it and everything. So all of this was very interesting for them. And therefore they started like exploring different nations and like trying to understand where they are. So they came up with the idea that, oh, so initially it was just USA, Russia, but then but then they came up with the idea that, oh, even the Arab, Arab nations had um, oil. So they, but then Western nations tried to influence that. And then uh, Arab nations were like, oh, we don't want Western nations to influence influence the kind of oil prices that we are going to determine. So they formed this uh, some, something called as OPEC, so which is also known as OPEC. So therefore, like after like forming this alliance, which has like Kuwait, Qatar, and everyone together, so they essentially right now they have uh, control over the oil. Eighty percent of the world oil is being supplied by, by OPEC. Now the point is that um, oil essentially impacts a lot of like politics because um, because of the very fact that like the the very fact that I told you like it impacts the economy of nation the 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 returns that the nation is going to get so uh, the fact that oil again is also very volatile like it can go like the the price can go high and low based on like things like war things like internal conflicts things like uh, things like um, COVID-19 because essentially in the COVID-19 you had negative um, oil prices. So because of the fact that Western nations always used to think that if Muslim uh, majority nations are going to have a lot of access to oil, is going to 
impact the economy of oil in general in, on the global scale. They always try to, you know, interfere in the politics of um, Middle Eastern nations because they used to think that, oh, if I'm going to intervene in these nations, I'm going to be able to have the proper ability to control as to how it's working or ability to control that, oh, it's not instable so that like, you know, it doesn't impact my oil market, right? So that was the primary reason why um, a lot of politics internationally happened. But then again, because the USA was going ahead and like invading, not invading per se, but interfering a lot of um, in in a lot of ways in the um, in the Middle Eastern nations. Um, Middle East nations essentially hated that idea, and again led to like more um, US against um, like understanding and ideologies. Um, but again, the nutshell is that you know, um, firstly, I think USA tries to also like gain a lot of so USA or for that matter any nation. I think USA, Russia, and China they all are in the this like search of like oil and access to oil so that obviously you have all of that which i said that you have the access to economy military and everything but then um the because of which i think russia uh, usa was always trying to like have good access was persian gulf but also current day they're trying to have there's this whole conflict between usa and russia towards the baltic region in order to get and extract oil so just know that oil can also lead to wars because because they, obviously it has so much uh, impact towards you insofar as you know your economy is concerned so what you want to know in terms of oil is that um oil is never going to end like the demand for oil is never going to end and therefore um and and the same reasons a lot of industries are impacted by it so there's this one uh, article that i was reading that like even if you want to like replace all of the cars with electric cars it still is not going to like stop the oil demand because it's going to take 25 years for you to replace all the electric cars on the in, in the world, right? Meaning it's not going to change. The world is not going to change in short term, so it's short, short term term. So if anyone in the debate says that, oh, there's global crisis for oil demand. So just tell them that, no, that's not true. Um, a lot of like, um, like industries are dependent on it. I think I've given you full, um, like crude oil, bedding, carpets, computers, packaging, curtains, and everything is dependent on oil. Moving on, I think obviously you can obviously read this article about why oil politics exists and why it is problematic. Go on if you want to know more about it. The new colonialism, I think this is something which you all probably know about. I think it's basically indirect way of getting control or influence or other nations, um, basically mostly developed nations because it's also a very good, very huge um, like rat race between these, these nations that oh, who is going to be able to have the most impact over these like the developing nations and undeveloped nations so they essentially do it by financial and trade policies um just a second and So they essentially do it by financial and trade policies. They go ahead and try to have as much of amount of like exploitation, the same amount of uh, exploitation that they could have done um, by colonial means. But then obviously by that time, everybody was trying to get independent. So what they came up with was that, oh, we, what we'll do is that have like have this entire set of like dependence of these nations on us um through economic means so this could look like um you know like even after like philippines got independence from usa what they did was like impose any unequal treaties to the nations that they don't have a large amount of economic leeway but it could look like china going ahead like uh dumping in bangladesh or it could look like america essentially like having a lot large number of um access towards the african nations with respect to the resources that they have um it could also look like mnc's investing in developing nations because it essentially uh, um, gives them some amount of dependency on these mncs because the working of mncs essentially is going to like um you know a having um so the reason why these nations essentially go and like have um like establish mncs in these nations is because of two reasons obviously um cheap labor cheap raw, raw, raw materials um going ahead and like exploiting these both of the, these things really easy but then obviously they would have more returns but they would never give back those returns in terms of profit to these individuals obviously that means it's exploitation uh, exploitation of resources but there's a common argument that is there which means that if is also a part is also a way of neo-colonialism uh, because it gives out loan and it traps you in terms of the cycle of loans, which means that if you don't pay, you're in the debt trap and therefore you would have to pay more interest. And that's problematic. Uh, moving on, I think we know what um, neo-colonialism is. Now moving on to the climate change and why it is like 
the difficult. So I think that the, the basic idea, and I think it's very clear, is that um, US, Russia, China are the biggest like contributors towards to climate change um, and CO2 emissions. Uh, but the fact is that like it's not just like the nations who are essentially contributing the most are impacted the most. I think the South, the global South is impacted the most with respect to climate change, um, high level, high sea levels, or like high level of um, like, like greenhouse gases uh, emission and um, uh, increased temperature and stuff like that um, impact in terms of, um, you know, like lack of healthy water, tropical diseases and everything. So it basically has become very dif difficult for even the nations who don't contribute towards um, like climate change. So, for example, Maldives is essentially like if in case if we continue to do what we're with, with what we're doing, essentially is going to lead to you know like Maldives essentially like um um being eaten up by floods. So that's problematic. So the idea is like even if like countries want to st like stop climate change and they want to like you know um cam combat that, I think it's not possible because of two reasons. One is economic reason because you know green tech and everything is very inaccessible. It essentially, is of very high cost. So, um, so you know, like it's easier because countries have been able to use conventional sources of energies. So it's oil based. Uh, it's difficult to replace oil based um, like energies to sustainable energies. And in order to get alternative forms of energies, you have to have good R and D, good investment, which developing nations actually don't have. But secondly, affordability toward the, like sustainable development is also very less. Which means that you know, in general, it's very difficult for developing nations to be able to you know adapt to these technologies and adapt to the to these base. But secondly, political reasons. I think like it's this the, this general idea that you know USA and China tries to go ahead and like. Um, blame other nations and developing nations that oh you know what we have like sustainable others are not so this blame game is continuously going ahead and like trying to blame developing nations for the things that they have done um and also the fact that you know it's very problematic because developed nations still now have been able to exploit the resources and were able to develop themselves simply because they were able to use those resources however because developing nations are now doing it and because they aren't on the equal footing now developed nations have the leeway to go ahead and call them out and say that oh you know what stop like using resources and stop exploiting resources, go ahead and have sustainable forms of energy because it asks them to like invest more. And it's so much of like a high cost, which means that developing nations don't have the ability to go ahead and do so. So this Western shifting blame on developing nations always exists. And then secondly, you have this thing called, um, you have this thing called Western nations going ahead and exploiting resources. So uh, a lot of outsourcing of developed nations from developing nations happen so in terms of resources which means you don't have to extract your extract your own resources you go ahead and like extract the resources from developing nations meaning again climate change but then secondly you also go ahead and like dump dump a lot of like garbage in these nations so that's problematic but before i go on to the last slide i want to have this discussion and then we'll try to um, end it so what do you guys think about um this house believes that developed economy should halt or reverse economic growth as a solution to climate change Well, for the proposition, I think that, you know, the entire idea of see, um, that how they in the past did something which has caused a problem for today, so they have a responsibility to fix it today, which can be emphasized further by just saying that, look, irrespective of the amount of, um, you know, burden that is upon these developed countries, even if you think that they do not have this burden upon them simply because they were forced in the line and they just did something which others might have, but better than them. So in this scenario also, the issue is that they have the power to mend this particular issue and that e even for themselves, they need to make sure that this world exists in the future and to ensure that climate change isn't exactly hurting them as well as hurting their trade routes. This is just a small precautionary investment. So rather than to look at it like reversing economic development, we think that is stagnating economic development at best for these countries. Hmm. Um. Y'all, can I, can anyone tell me what is the principle that is applicable here? Which principle? The principle of um. I don't know how to say this, but simply about the fact of remunerations, I guess. But simply that you know, again, they did something in the past. They're responsible for it. So principle of reparation. Reparations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes. I think the first thing that opposition might try to counter over here is 
that again, irrespective of the amount of responsibility that developed countries have in this scenario, the issue with this entire uh, argument is that you do not need developed countries to actually hold their economic development. You need them to uh, base their economic development on ecological needs. That is to say, you do not want uh, environment conservation as a viewpoint that is only based upon some sort of economic harm. Because at the end of the day, this entire principle then will be based upon some sort of an unstable idea which would break in the future which would lead to countries actually coming out of it so this might look like countries coming out of the paris agreement for example not that they did this but yeah for example countries coming out of the paris agreement currently because the past idea of climate change agreements was based upon the principle of them not doing enough economic development so the counterfactual then that opposition might propose is that rather than stopping economic development, we should base economic development on climate change, which would look then look like United States investing in developing countries just to ensure that there is green tech present over there, which then ensures that United States has further investment in these countries as well. And in an incentive of some sort of a view or new uh, neo -coli I am so sorry about this, but yeah you get it right so yeah. some sort of that principle but also that it would be good for these developing countries because they would now have much more further investment to protect themselves from climate change it would further be also probably like you know giving subsidies to developing nations so because of the fact that they have the ability to go and access green tech much easier than developing nations can probably go ahead and like give subsidies to um developing nations to go ahead and like combat um climate change Okay, anything else, um, Vidant, Navya? Arav, Nishka? I have no point. Okay. Okay, so I think I'll just like quickly go and like finish the last slide and then the last discussion. So um, I think there is this general misconception about uh, military sanctions and um, military actions and economic sanctions. So the fact is that um, the only difference between, and that's my opinion, is that the only difference between um, military action and um, economic sanction is direct and indirect killing. The fact that economic sanctions essentially are like also do a large scale harm because people think that, oh, if it is economy, it's, how can it, how large can it be, like can be the impact? But that's wrong because you think that if military is involved, oh, like people are going to die because army is involved and stuff like that. But that's essentially also the case with economic um sanctions as well because that's a, a that's a common debate that exists like military sanctions as opposed to economic sanctions so people think that economic sanctions are more acceptable than invading and bombing nations which is fair however um why and how economic sanctions essentially work is that you essentially want to like um influence foreign policy of one nation so it could look like you know a particular nation is stealing ipr they're devaluing their currency so that you know they can increase their exports so you want to punish that and therefore you want to change their foreign policy and you want to target a particular government and therefore you go ahead and impose in economic sanctions. So this could look like limiting exports, imports, transfer of money, but also no investment in these nations can also, can, it can be two, two ways. It can be like unilateral or it can be multilateral. Unilateral economic sanctions don't really, really work a lot because again, the same reason that you have already talked to me, talked to me about is that, you know, like it, there is interconnectivity between the world. So if one country stops trading with the other nation, it shouldn't essentially like harm them. But then if a large number of countries stop trading with one nation, it could harm them in a much larger um, like scale. And that happens most often than not. Um, but the problem is that like, even though economic sanction exists, it is the harm is not just one side, right? If I have already invested in one nation, I obviously want like returns from that nation. But if I suddenly stop investment, I'm not getting returns, I'm not getting profit. So it's obviously a harm for me as well. But secondly, imports and exports. I mean, obviously the fact that you are importing and exporting, which means that you had some amount of like mutual agreement and mutual benefits towards each other, but then now you're not getting it, which means it impacts the other nation as well, right? So that's the harm of like economic sanction. But then going ahead, I think the fact that, um, and there's an example of like how US also like lost, lost jobs in economic 
um, uh, benefits from a particular nation when they went ahead and sanctioned them. So the fact that economic sanctions don't always work, so uh, it failed in the case of Saddam Hussein um, leaving Kuwait, but also the fact that uh, Iran still supports terrorism irrespective of how many uh, economic sanctions you imposed on them. But the fact that how, if you want to have a good amount of economic sanction and like a efficient economic sanction, you have a unified effort, meaning if if you want to sanction North Korea and China is not a particip like not participating in that sanction, it shouldn't essentially work because China essentially deals a lot with North Korea. So you want a unite unified front in order to have sanctions being effective. But the problem then is if you have unified front, you're going to have so much of destruction, meaning it impacts GDP, it impacts civilians, it impact impacts people. So if a country which does not have staple food is going to have to face that, oh, I cannot export or I cannot import that staple food, like just like that, that particular amount of food, which means that they don't have access to food. They don't have access to money. They don't have access to uh, electricity. So all of these things can essentially make people die eventually, meaning the crisis is much larger. You're affecting civilians as opposed to just uh, army individuals. And that's even problematic. So you have to just frame as to how economic sanctions are not always the best, because you know, if often and not people face um difficult to support economic sanctions. But just like this last discussion, and then we'll you can just go and like watch the match, is this house would abandon the use of economic sanctions as a tool of achieving political harms. Give me the proposition and opposition and go watch your match. An argument that proposition would run is that it is quite hard for like a lot of countries to agree on a multilateral economic sanction in the first place because of the differing ideologies. And if it's always unilateral, then it actually doesn't have that much effect on the target country. Very good. I think the first opposition argument then would be on the principle that if you're trying to involve much more smaller countries into this entire issue, if you're able to, let's, if your main aim is to ensure much more political involvement of smaller countries like Ghana, etc., note that even with the alternatives, you'll not be able to achieve that. That is to say that irrespective of economic sanctions, they'll not, they'll not be able to militarily act also. And though this might not be a binary, we think that the influence of a particular country in regards to global power is proportional to the amount of um, resources that they have or the amount of uh, developed resources that they have. And this might then put them on a back hold in anything. So this is not achievable at any point of time. And that is why blocks such as United Nations are present, just to ensure that they're able to create a political usage of their voice. And we think that that in itself is enough for the current moment to ensure some involvement from their side. Wait, so the nutshell of the argument is? Yeah, the nutshell of the argument is that irrespective of whatever you do, small countries are not going to get involved in the global phase. Okay, so then I'm going to, okay, then I'm going to impose economic sanctions on other nations. Yeah, it was like an opposition argument actually. Okay, what else? Um, something for econ for something for opposition then. Yeah, that's what I was trying to tell you. This entire small country argument was for the opposition. How because come? Of, because that's what I'm trying to say. That your aim from proposition. What is your burden to prove from proposition? What are you trying to do? You're, You're saying that you would abandon economic sanctions, and you are saying then that small nations would never be able to impose like sanctions. So isn't it like for proposition? Right. What I'm trying to establish over here is that economic sanctions still can be imposed through some sort of political measure. That is to say, a small nation can make a large nation do this. This might look like the African bloc asking the United States to do something that is still possible and that still holds some amount of political leverage and thus require them to have a political leverage. On the uh, other side, though, irrespective of like let's say no economic sanctions being present any alternative would not provide smaller nations a stand or a space to actually okay. function on okay. 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 So if there is no economic sanction they can't do anything else yeah. exactly because like it, it, they don't have economic power they don't have any power simply saying that 
but i think you can still use it on propositions the way how i have like put it in my opinion so what you can do is that um i think the framing then could look like you know these these developing nations have you know better resources and they at least have the ability to go ahead and say that look we wouldn't give you the exports to these resources can we then also argue that developing countries then have a higher leverage on side proposition simply because of the fact that um, developed countries would want to listen to them in some scenarios so like we do not think that in, in the absence of economic sanctions military actions are going to be the go to method it's most probably going to be political boycott and in that political boycott there is a likelihood of the smaller nations being able to create blocks so this might look like the african bloc or asean or all the small asian countries coming together or south american countries or um, this entire uh, organization of south american countries coming together so this we think then pushes over the idea of regional blocks okay anything else nishka vedan but you know like furthering on I'm, i'm really sorry i'm interrupting again but like furthering on the impact of this very argument we can probably then say that this counters the overall excess of power that is in the hands of a few countries right now because if mm-hmm. you're basing yourself on only political power then then united states as a sole actor doesn't have that much amount of power does it because united states currently has been able to base itself upon soft power and hard power but in the absence of hard power that they have currently the soft power doesn't exactly stand so is is the case with us uh, uk france russia china because currently no country is so much so in love with these countries that they will support them irrespective of the scenario right they just like hmm. symbols of money currently in the absence of money they won't mean anything hmm okay anything else opposition i want to argue with strong opposition like why economic sanctions are better i mean just like you can just like see that like if not economic sanctions what are you essentially do so the moment when you are abandoning it what does it look like on opposition we can then probably say that you know this entire principle of whether or not you're harming the government or the people of the government that is to say that in the scenario when you start pushing i'm sorry am i audible yes 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 in the scenario yeah in the scenario where in you start to like not push economic sanctions then in, even in the case of political boycott or even in the case of military um, let's say interventions etc it does base itself upon the fact that the local population is going to suffer whereas you can prevent this through targeted economic sanctions that through targeted economic sanctions you still able to let's say relieve the people but in both the other scenarios you're not able to even do that and then the let and then the involvement of uh, large global organizations such as un also fails because un was basing itself upon the idea of establishing peace but these would then be used as the very organization that is creating disruption in the very first place if they are used for political boycott if they are used for the coordinated multilateral military response hmm fair enough anything else we can also run a principal argument that even if like economic sanctions might not have like an economic uh, impact on the target country as such it does have kind of like a psychological impact so you kind of condoning the action of the target country if you like remove um, economic sanctions and you would be like just left with uh, negotiations and diplomacy and actually just like condoning the behavior on like the political front and more often than not it would not lead to any changes while there's like a more likelihood of ch- uh, like more, more likely heard if there's something happening with economic sanctions yeah so basically it's still pure like even if it is punitive it's still good because it's going to give some impose some amount of deterrence on these people and that's what you want for these individuals to change their stance and i think that's pretty much it for today <sighs> cool so thank you so much if you have any questions you can obviously always ask me and then go back and read um, as much as you can tomorrow we are going to have international relations debate good luck thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am